Welcome back to Applied Mathematics. In this video, we're going to be talking about writing equations. Writing equations is one of the most powerful tools in the arsenal of problem solving. Looking at situations that arise in the world, trying to turn them into mathematical equations, which we can then use our tools of algebra to solve in order to generate a numerical answer to the problem in our situation. There's a lot of really interesting things we can do with that, most of which unfortunately we don't have enough time to look at. So I apologize that the examples that we're going to be looking at in this class are mostly very generalized, very abstract, and they feel like a scavenger hunt riddle more than something that will actually come up in the world. A lot of that is the limitation of trying to make this course broadly accessible. If I focus on examples that are important in carpentry, then someone who is studying um, a um, health professional program is going to be completely bored. If I focus on examples that are applicable to a surgical technician, then somebody who is w studying welding is going to be lost. So in order to get the breadth of everyone into this one course, I have to be very general. I don't get to dive into the particular applications the way that I would really like to. Um, I try to um, account for that a little bit in some of the problem solving, but this video is really kind of boring in that regard. I encourage you, fill in your own particular examples. Discuss with your classmates the kinds of applications that you can see might use the same tools, just fill in with a little bit more particulars in the phrasing. Let me get my head out of the way and we'll dive in. A very basic example might tell us that two more than half of our unknown value is seven. What is that number? When looking at writing equations, we generally want to try to distill things down like this. All right. Again, a practical application is not going to say two more than half of our unknown value is seven. A practical application is going to take some doing to get us even to this point. Once we are at this point though, the next important thing to do is identify the verb. In this case, the verb is is. Verbs are nice because verbs are equal signs. Everything that comes before the verb in the statement will be on the left-hand side of the equation. Everything that comes after the verb in the statement will be on the right-hand side of the equation. In this case, the right-hand side of the equation is going to be the number seven, and that's it. The next thing that I look for is our unknown value. Our unknown value, we are going to represent using a variable. I use the letter X because that's what mathematicians do. There's nothing particularly important about using X. You can use literally any letter you would like, a letter of the English alphabet, a letter of the Greek alphabet, a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, perfectly fine. You can use another symbol that looks like a letter if you would like. I had a student who was an art history major a couple of years ago 
who decided that he wanted to use the Batman symbol as his variable every time a variable showed up. And he gave up on it after a while because it took too long to draw the Batman symbol every time, but technically it works. Then we're going to look to see what's going on with our variable. In this particular problem, I'm going to break this statement up a little bit further. We don't have just our unknown variable, we have half of our unknown variable. Of almost always means multiply. Half of our unknown value is one half times x. And with that, we are nearly there. We now have this last bit of statement, two more than. To get more than something, we are going to add. In this case, we're going to add to two. One half x plus two equals seven. That's an equation we can solve. I can subtract 2 from both sides of the equation. Then, to get x by itself, x is being multiplied by 1 half, I need to divide by 1 half. Dividing by 1 half is the same thing as multiplying by 2. So I get that x is 10. Technically speaking, at this point we are done. Although I do strongly encourage you, because the problem was stated to us in complete sentences, it is a very good habit to answer in a complete sentence. What is that number? the number is 10. Answering a question that's given in complete sentences with a response that's in complete sentences makes you sound like a more intelligent person. And what's the point of getting a college education if you don't sound like a more intelligent person when you're done? If you are a more intelligent person and you don't sound like it, it's not going to impress anyone. So, for that, if no other reason, it's a good habit to get into. It's also a really good sanity check. When you solve a problem, as we look at more complicated problems, understanding whether we've actually solved anything, whether we've actually answered the question at hand, can get a little bit difficult. Writing your answer in a complete sentence gives you a sanity check. Does your answer make sense? Does your answer answer the question? Reread the question, reread your answer, see if they make sense. If you get an answer, right, you're given some information about the capacity of the boat and you're asked, how many passengers can this boat take on this voyage? And you answer that the boat can take 27 and two thirds passengers. 27 and two-thirds? How do you take two-thirds of a passenger? Right. So immediately you see that, wait, this answer doesn't make any sense. I needed to round. And then you have to start thinking about how do you have to round? Do you want to round up or do you have to round down? Right. 27 and two-thirds would round up to 28, but having more than the maximum capacity on the boat would be a problem. So. Despite that, the problem, the situation tells you always round down and report to 27 passengers. It gives you a sanity check on did you answer the right question? If we have some setup followed by the question of um, how many four by eight foot sheets of plywood do you need to purchase? And you answer, it's going to take 27 cuts that's a problem. There's not a match between the question and the answer. It helps you know that something has gone wrong. All right, so a couple of reasons there. 
it's a good habit to get into. Again, the examples I'm showing you in this video are very silly. They're very abstract and the sentence doesn't really help. I hope that that explanation gives you a little bit as to why it might be more useful. And you'll see more interesting examples in homework and practice problems uh, as well. For now, let's look at something slightly more complicated. The sum of two numbers is 15. If the larger number is one less than three times the smaller number, what are the two numbers? This problem is interesting. Immediately, I hope what jumps out to you is that this problem is asking about two numbers. There are two unknowns in this problem. There are several ways that you can approach how to deal with this. I I have often tried to teach the one variable approach because we technically only know how to solve equations involving one variable. And any textbook that you find at this level is going to use the one variable approach. I know from watching students over the years that most students are going to try to include two variables anyway and then get really stuck. So I have taken to teaching the two variable approach where we're going to call one of these numbers x and the other number y. Again, you can use any variables you would like, just you need a couple of them in this case. Then we go to our statement and we start looking for information. The sum of two numbers is 15. If we take our two numbers and add them together, the result we get is 15. Our two numbers are x and y. So x plus y equals 15. That's one equation. There is a rule in linear algebra, the study of multiple unknowns in a problem, that you need a number of equations equal to the number of unknowns. Here is one equation. We have two unknowns, so we need another equation. The larger number is one less than three times the smaller number. The larger number we represented using x is our verb one less than three times the smaller number. So we take our smaller number y, we multiply by three, and we subtract one. One less than three times the smaller number. There's a second equation. In order to actually solve this problem, we need to find a way to combine these two equations. Technically speaking, the way to do that is to rearrange the equations so that one side of the equations are the same and use the transitive property. 
but that's kind of tedious. And so there is a simpler way. Because I have one of the equations solved for one of the variables, I can then use substitution. X is 3y minus 1. So I can replace x with 3y minus 1. in that first equation. So instead of x plus y equals 15, it's 3y minus 1 plus y equals 15. Clean up, combine some like terms. 4y minus 1 equals 15. Add 1 to both sides of the equation. 4y equals 16. Divide both sides of the equation by 4. y equals 4. All right, that's half of our answer, but again, we have two unknowns. So now that we have solved for y, we now need to take that and put it into the other equation to solve for x. x equals 3 times y, but we now know that y is 4 minus 1. And I get that x is 11. I can write my response using a complete sentence and say that the two numbers are 11 and 4. Let's take a look at one more example. And here I am going to put something a little bit closer to a practical application. Again, I know this feels more like a scavenger hunt than a practical application, but it will at least let us put some approximate measurements into the situation. You need to cut a 48.0 foot chain into three pieces in order to install a hanging sculpture. The longest piece will be three times as long as the shortest piece, and the middle piece will be 3.0 feet longer than the shortest piece. How long are the three pieces? This problem looks intimidating, first of all, because we have measurements and approximate values going on. Second of all, because we are adding details. We're talking about a chain. We're talking about hanging a sculpture. So the first thing to do is to not panic and realize that most of the details are extraneous. I start this problem at the end. We are asked, how long are the three pieces? Looking back through the problem, I see it talking about a longest piece, a shortest piece, and a middle piece, and then the shortest piece again. So there's my starting point. I am going to need three variables, one for the longest piece, one for the middle piece, one for the shortest piece, and because I am very boring, I'm going to use x, y, and z. Again, you could use any symbols you like, but that's what I'm going to use. Because I have three unknowns, I am going to be looking for three equations in this case, and there are three equations. They're a little bit hidden. So I'm going to start with the one that's really hidden. The chain that we are cutting into three pieces was originally 48.0 feet long. I am going to make an assumption that is probably not the best assumption, but I'm going to assume that when I cut this chain into pieces, I don't really lose any length. I know that that's not true. When you cut a chain into pieces, you are going to completely destroy one of the links on the chain at each place you cut. 
The real assumption that I'm making here is that that difference is less than a tenth of a foot. If I'm dealing with a chain that has relatively short links that are an inch or so, or maybe a little bit less, then cutting that one link of chain is not going to cause the measurement to be different. Within rounding, it is still going to be the case that if I add up the lengths of the three pieces, I get 48.0 feet. Right. Again, in some practical applications, if I had more precision, if I knew something about the chain where I knew that each link that I cut off was going to be a quarter of a foot, three inches long, that might make a difference in what I'm looking at here. But for our purposes, that's going to be good enough. Then I've got a couple of pieces of information about the cuts. The longest piece will be three times as long as the shortest piece. The longest piece we've already decided is labeled as X. My verb here is will be instead of is, but that's still an equal sign. Three times as long as the shortest piece. The shortest piece I called Z, so I'm going to get that X is three times Z. Likewise, the middle piece will be three feet longer than the shortest piece. All right, the middle piece we called Y, again, will be verb equal sign. Three feet longer means add on an extra three feet, so it'll be Z plus 3.0 feet. From here, the process is the same. I had an X in the original equation. I now know that X is the same thing as 3Z. I had a Y in the original equation. I now know that Y is the same thing as Z plus 3.0. And that gives me an equation to work with. Simplifying on the left hand side, I have some like terms to combine. 3z plus z plus z is 5z. I can subtract 3.0 from both sides of the equation. And from here, I'm going to assume that that 5 on the z is an exact value. Very often, the coefficients on variables do turn out to be exact values because they come from literally adding things together. I have five things that are each of length z. I have exactly five of them. The length is approximately z, but the approximation is all in the z, not in the five. And so from that, I know that when I divide here, the only thing that matters is the approximate value 45.0, which has three significant digits. And I get that Z is 9.00 feet. Right. That's great to know, but that's not the end of the story, because of course I have that x is 3z. So if I multiply 3 times 9.00 feet, again, 3 is exact, 9.00 is approximate, so three significant digits, I have that x is 27.0 feet. And for y? y is going to be z plus 3.0 feet. So 9.00 plus 3.0. They're both approximate. I use the weakest uh, precision, which is the nearest tenths in this measurement. 
and I get that y is 12.0 feet. So my three lengths of chain are 9.00 feet, 27.0 feet, and 12.0 feet. Write that out in complete sentences, and we'll call it a day. I think that that's far enough for this video. I hope that that gave you a little bit of a taste of how this might be applicable. Again, in your particular chosen um, profession of the future, where you are working towards getting towards, or even where you are working now, the specifics are going to vary wildly. If looking at this has uh, triggered something in your brain where you can see that this is a situation that might come up in your uh, professional life where these sorts of things might be useful, um, share that with your classmates. That's something interesting to talk about. Um, and quite honestly, I'm curious as well. I know what has shown up in the places that I have done work which have not been where most of you have been doing work. So I'm not as familiar with your careers as I am with the mathematics that is going to be this foundation. I always like seeing how things show up in sometimes unexpected places. For now, I think that's good enough. Thanks as always for joining me. I'll see you next time.